you will not make a million dollars off of the cold leads you got that year that you made the million bucks. You make a million off of this, it would make a lot of great content. Why am I spending all these thousands and doing all this marketing if in fact all Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Ricky Caroo! He is an investor, a speaker, and soon to be remembered, in my opinion, as a legend in the industry. The cool thing about what he was doing was he was documenting everything. Like he would post his calls, his work he was putting in, the strategies, he was sharing everything. Make calls all morning, do a weekly email, and do make videos all afternoon. The whole premise of this industry is talking to people you do and don't know to help them buy and sell real estate. Like all the people that went through 2008, like myself, we wish we could go back to 2008. Oh my God, that was an amazing market. Like in a retracted market, your business explodes as the market re-expands. If it doesn't cash flow, do not buy it. Then I may flip it really quickly, but I'm not gonna hang on to something that's, that I'm losing money on. But the 2,000 people that did watch it got so much out of it and brought so much value. And we have a really special guest. I actually came across this individual. I don't even know if you know this, Ricky. Like, I remember seeing you on a Gary V video. Are you documented going out to see Gary V? This, how long ago was that? That was a long time ago. Yeah, like three or four years ago. Uh, you're on mute. Can we hear you? Yep, we can hear you now. You can hear me? Yep. I don't know what happened. Yeah, yeah, that was like three or four years ago. Yeah, so, you know, at that time, I saw Ricky, you know, he's he's putting out the content, he's building his business, and the cool thing about what he was doing was he was documenting everything. Like, he would post his calls, his work he was putting in, the strategies, he was sharing everything for free. And then he was coaching agents. I think he still is coaching agents for free. So he's just putting out all this free value. And as a result, his brand continued to grow and grow and grow. And like, you know, obviously his he has the credentials to back it up. He was the number one agent in the whole state where he works. And, um, you know, all that stuff was great. But then online, his brand just continued to grow and his presence within the real estate community continued to grow. I see him speaking at events now. His YouTube channel blew up, Instagram, all the social media, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so... He built it from just sharing everything that he's doing. And uh, it's incredible to see, you know, how it just worked out, putting out the free value, the whole Gary Vee, you know, model, it actually played out for you. And so thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time, bro. Yeah, absolutely, man. My my mic is like really low, huh? It's lower than mine, yeah, bro. I don't know what happened. Let's see. Oh, that sounds better. You. Sounds good on my end. You can Yeah, it sounds good? better now. Yep. All right. So yeah, what I man, wanted well, to bring, yeah, I wanted to uh, bring you on today, Ricky, was obviously, you know, if you could give people just, I gave you a little background there. If you could give people a quick background, most everybody on here is aware of you, but there might be a few people who aren't. And then we can get into some of the topics I wanted to ask you about. No, happy, happy to, man. Good to be here. I, uh, I've i been doing real estate for, since 2002. So 21 years now, mostly as an agent, um, went through the crash and all that, um, you know, came back and crushed it. And uh, I was just super focused on just making a million bucks a year. It's all I ever wanted. I uh, grew up roofing houses with my dad, um, did a bunch of different jobs, uh, went to four different colleges in two years, dropped out. And I just wanted to make a mill. And uh, it took me a while. 2017 was the first year I actually did that. Um, I sold 100 properties a year as an agent for eight years in a row as a single agent. And then in 2017-ish, I wrote two books because I was like, man, the way that I built the business was way is completely different than what coaches will coach you. So I thought I have something different to bring to the table and uh, wrote two books and then started coaching agents for free. And, um, you know, it just took off. And uh, here we are. I'm out of production right now. Although I, 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 <laughs> I actually love selling so much that I'm at, I actually, I, 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 every day I'm like, I could go back to selling and, and like sell a hundred million worth of real estate in the next 12 months by myself. Um, I think about that all the time. When did you switch over by the way, Ricky, from like, cause I know you were doing the production. You'd kind of, well, that was one of the things that you prided yourself on for a long time was like, I'm actually doing the work. I'm doing yeah. the things I'm telling you guys about. And I don't have a big team. I don't give out all my business. I do it myself. You know, remember you talked about that for years. 
I think I think the biggest thing is whatever you guys are doing, whether it's investing, you're hustling, you're flipping, you're wholesaling, your mortgage, you're an agent, whatever it is, th- those are really you're really grinding hard, and you 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 will get to the point where you don't want to do this anymore. You're 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 enti- the entire the entire thing needs to be okay. I'm going to do this to get to this get to this place where I can put myself in position to do continue doing this if I want to, but I don't have to, and then eventually phase out of it. Um, so I just feel like I'm following the natural progression. Um, I did just complete focused on sales for 20 years and I was burnt out. I mean, I did a hundred deals a year for eight years in a row by myself with an assistant. And, um, I was just cringing every time a client called. And so that that's when you know it's time to do something different. Now I've been out of the game for a year and a half now, just purely making content, traveling, speaking, building other businesses, buying a lot of real estate, doing things like that. And that's been a lot of fun. Um, I think I just needed a break. I literally teeter on should I go back into sales for a year and sell a hundred million and show everybody how to do it and then step away again. I literally think about that every day. Um, just because the fact I love it so much, I could I could crush it and it would make a lot of great content because <laughs> I was, yeah. like you say, I was documenting everything. I was documenting my listing prep, my listing appointments, my calls, my cold call sessions, uh, sh- pro when I was showing properties. I was documenting every little thing. Um, so, and what's really funny is I never used social media to build my real estate business. I used it just to build my coaching business. I was documenting to build a, an audience of agents to build a coaching business versus using it to find buyers and sellers. Um, you know, it's interesting. So yeah, yes. it's been about a year and a half since I stepped out and I think about it every day. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. And it, what, what, it's kind of like, you know, the a lot of people will say, well, you know, you did this during the boom years, but even prior to that, you like you said, you did it for eight years where you were selling a hundred homes a year, making that yeah, income target. It was the first year I did a hundred deals, fourteen from fourteen to twenty one. Um so it, it was uh and and I was comfortable there. I always had about twenty five ish or so listings and about fifteen or so pending deals at any given time. And that was like a really easy pace that I could keep um you know anything there was a point I had like 38 properties under contract that was pushing it that was getting a little bit out of control but there's a breaking point for everybody yeah um you got it so how did you and and then how did you transition out of that you know from because you obviously you, you built maybe you could talk about this real quick on your tactics strategy and then we could get into how the transition occurred but like how did you you know build the business because obviously you talked about we're all digital marketers here. We want to get better digital, but that wasn't your strategy. Your strategy was very traditional. And I be, email was a big component, email newsletters, correct? Well, email was my digital, right? Yeah. Um, I look at that as a social media platform. It's a place where I post original, consistent content for my followers. You know, I mean, it's the same thing as social. You build a following, you, you post something and a certain amount of people see it that's within that following per se. So, it's the same thing. Um, that was my social media. Um, and if you think about it like that, hell, I was on social media. I was like one of the first ones on social. What do you think about it like that? Because I started doing these newsletters back in 2007, every Wednesday. And uh, literally is what blew me up. And I, when I got to where I was selling 100 properties a year, I really wasn't prospecting too much anymore. The The, the audience I built up with the email was just residual business every day. Um, and that's really the secret behind it. So what I did, I did handwritten letters and some postcards. Um, I did, uh, I called every property owner I could. Um, I did the, the weekly email. That's all I did. I didn't do expireds or social media, Zillow for sale by owners. I didn't do any of that stuff. Open houses, client appreciation parties, um, door knocking. I didn't do any of that. Um, I literally just picked out a subdivision, called them, introduced myself, tell them I'm here to help you. You want to do something? No? Cool. Help you when you want to. Let me stay in touch. Weekly email. Um, but you would, when you would call these people tactically, though, you would say, 
they don't need you now. I'm going to go ahead and add you to the email list. So what was yeah, that? Because like, I didn't you, really you built it that way. I would never use the word email list because they're just like, hell no. They they get like 15 emails from, you know, shitty ass agents every day. Um, the secret behind it is when you got, wait, I don't know how many people are real estate agents, mortgage, I don't know who I'm It's 50-50. It's half mortgage, half real estate, somewhere on But the thing is, is that it's astounding the amount of agents that spend thousands of dollars to not call people so they don't have to call people just to turn around and call those leads that they pay thousands of bucks for, right? Um, it's scary. And uh, so you have to understand it all comes back to the same activity, talking to people, okay? So, so when you start breaking this down in your mind, you start to realize that, wait a minute, why am I spending all these thousands and doing all this marketing if, in fact, all of that is just to lead right back to a conversation? We're right back to square one. I just have a conversation with people for literally a penny or two. Um, when, when, you, when you crack that code, it's a hack. When you, when, you, when you crack that code and you realize that everybody's the same, like all the leads are the same people, right? It, back in 2021... Um, agents bought 200 million leads. There's 350 million people in the U.S., whatever, right? You take out babies and teenagers, you got about 200 million people left, all right? <laughs> you know, round number speaking. They literally sold you every single person in the U.S. I mean, that's what it is. There were 6 million transactions. Um, 200 million leads were bought by agents. So, when you when you start breaking all this down, you you start to think like the leads that you buy, they're supposedly these hot leads. They're just the same people you could have called for a penny, and you having the say you could have the same exact conversation. Like I would never tell anybody to do this, but you could literally call property owners and pre just pretend like they're a Zillow lead. You could say, "Hey, um, I saw that you were online looking at these houses here recently. I was just going to follow up with that and see if there's anything I could do to help you." Right. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I don't know how you knew that. But, uh, I, you know, what are the chances that a property owner was looking online at some properties in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, eight months? Right. The property Pretty high. What? Fucking 100 percent. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's it's absurd. The the the, the links that agents go to try to get around just talking to someone um, to just turn right around and talk to someone. It's insane. So what is that? Is that called reluctance? Or what do you think it is? Yeah, I think it's just, uh, it, I, I don't know, because they, they end up calling the same person. <laughs> but they just yeah. spend a bunch of money, time, and energy to get there. And what I'm saying is you can literally just, okay, when you think about social media, this is what I think everyone should do, okay? Make calls all morning, do a weekly email, and do make videos all afternoon and get really good at social media. That's it. Done. End of story. Weekly email, calls all morning, social media all afternoon. Well, I don't want to make cold calls. Well, call fucking people that you got off social media. I don't care who you call, but if you're not talking to someone, you're not going to do any deals. I mean, the whole the whole premise of this industry is talking to people you do and don't know to help them buy and sell real estate. If you're not going to talk to people you do and don't know to help them buy and sell real estate, then you're not going to do any deals. It's really, 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 really simple when you break it all down. And so why people don't, and so when I realized that, I was like, give me a, just give me a list of every single person in the market that owns property and let me just go ahead. Because the only thing between you guys in a million years is thousands of one-on-one -on -one conversations. And what you're doing is you're, you're dragging this out over the course of like decades or even your whole life. You never even get there. You die, make, you die still selling because you just drug it out so long. On the other hand, I'm quite the opposite. Let me just make the thousands of calls over the next, say, three years, get to the million as quick as I can, and then I'm done. Because once you build it, you don't have to make any more calls, Um, you know, because people just call you. So I don't know, man. I feel like I, most of the time when I speak, I feel like I'm just talking to the top 1% of people who actually want to do something. And, you know, and, and for the people who really that, and I'm not picking on you, everybody does it differently. I know people that do a million bucks a year off of Zillow leads and door knocking and, you know, Facebook and, um, all every, like, you know, name the weirdest thing you've ever th heard of when it comes to lead gen. Like I know people make a million bucks a year off whatever the weirdest thing you've ever heard of that every single thing works. 
but but I'm just trying to make a point that whatever your thing is, it all comes back to talking to people. No matter how you slice and dice it, you got you got to talk to them or there's not going to be a next step. This is it, it it's the reason why I just I just fail to believe and I'll go on record and say I could care less if AI replaces real estate agents, but I just fail to believe it because I mean, maybe there's something I don't know. Maybe there's AI that, you know, ends up thinking for itself, like in a whole different capacity where it actually makes decisions based on the future, not the past or, um, some, some weird stuff we've never thought of. But if that's the case, you have to realize that it's not just real estate agents. (laughs) It's going to take out every single industry. Um, and so I'm just falling back on 95% of the stuff you worry about never happens. And the 5% that does, you can deal with it when it happens. Is that your, uh, is that kind of like your, your thing with the, yeah, I'd like to get, we have questions from the group as well, but I want to get into like your outlook for the market. Cause I know you talk a lot about this online. You talk to agents all the time about this. What's your outlook on the market where we're at right now? Cause we're at a, uh, you know, a multi-decade low in terms of number of transactions that are happening nationally, right, this year? Yeah. And what do you see in the future there? And then also, what do you think about this, uh, the recent, you know, commission case and all that stuff and how it's going to affect long-term? So the first, the market, we're, this is 2008 right now. Uh, we're not going to see prices go down. We we could see, correct, a little. Um, if interest, if mortgage rates went to 15%, we'd see a big price correction. So it's all kind of dependent on interest rates, mortgage rates primarily. Um, so it's hard to really predict what, what they're going to do. You would think that they're kind of done raising them. They might raise it another time or two. Inflation is getting where it needs to be. And then we'll just kind of be on this, you know, the long tail of a little bit higher rates for a while. Um, I think what that equals in that scenario is, is kind of flat prices. We saw a couple of predictions of like, you know, three to 5% appreciation next year. I think that's pretty, that's what I think. I think it's going to be up, but not up by a whole lot, which is great because we're basically at all time highs. I mean, even if we get into the 5% appreciation next year, I think we're still lower than the peak, which was, um, March 2022 or March, uh, April, May of 2022. Um, but I don't think we're going to see any huge crash. And I mean, do, man, you, you've got the YouTubers and all the people that say it's going to crash worse than 2008. It's going to drop 30% and all this and 40% and all this stuff. I mean, they said it, they say it every year and you know, every year I say, no, it's not. And here's why. Um, it's always a new excuse of why it's going to crash. Every fall, the market gets soft. Every fall and winter, the market gets soft. Even in 2021, the year of the boom, prices softened on a, on a national medium basis. It went from like 343 to 337. In, the, in that crazy boom year, it still softened on a median you know, basis. Um, no, nah, we're, we're good, man. Like, you guys got to realize that this is your 2008. And like all the people that went through 2008, like myself, we wish we could go back to 2008. It's like, man, if we could go back to 2008, think about what we could do with that. Because we look back and realize how massive of an opportunity that was because we were actually there. People did that didn't go through it. You can look at the data during the time and go and knowing what you know now where the markets went. You look at that and you think, oh, my God, that was an amazing market. Because you think price is 50% less, how easy is that to sell? How great of a deal and opportunity is that? Um, it's uh, Clients are coming out. I literally had clients coming out the woodworks to buy properties at half off. It was amazing. It was the best time to be in the business. Um, and they got really good deals and made a lot of money when they flipped those properties four years later and rebought with me and referred 10 people to me. That's literally how I got to 100 deals a year was in 2008 representing people who bought half price properties and sold them in three years, upgraded to something nicer, referred 10 people to me. That's it. It turns into a snowball. And the whole, the whole, the whole, the, the, the basis of the entire, your entire operation needs to be, how do I make lifelong friends with these people? Um, you know, how do I lock these people in like their family? That's the only way to really get to 100 deals or a million bucks a year. You're not going to do it from cold leads. 
you will not make a million dollars off of the cold leads you got that year that you made the million bucks. You make a million off of the three years prior's cold leads that turn into warmer leads over time that that compounded into this snowball of this massive database of people that love you. That's how you get there. It's a compounding of your database over time. You're not going to make- Yeah, and what's crazy, what's crazy is, um, you know, like this group, just so you to give you the context, Ricky, this group is that 1% you talked about, the action takers who are at the top of, you know, their companies and putting out, you know, doing the work. You know, there's several seven-figure earners here already, a lot of people trying to get there as well. But the thing I noticed is what happens during, you know, a downturn is like, you know, people's, obviously it's 2020 is always easy, you know, in hindsight, it's easy to say, but like when you're in it, it gets, it, it is, you know, it feels like there's a lot of shit coming at us, you know? And so it's like, you got to get over that That's mindset, like in you know? 2008, when you were in it, it's, it felt horrible and it felt yeah. like it was never going to end. Right. But looking back, um, you're like, man, that was actually a really good market. Same thing. Now you got a lot of crybabies out there right now and they don't realize how great of a market this is. Like this is their moment to expand their footprint in their market digitally on social through phone calls, through weekly emails. Like this is this is like the greatest moment you're gonna see for the next decade or so. This is the low of the cycle. And not only the low of the decade cycle that hits every 10 years, this is the low of the yearly cycle at the lowest par, par point of the 10 year cycle. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've yeah. got, you got these decade cycles that happened. 2008 was the last low, right? This is the new, this is, this is same amount of transactions. And then every winter, the market slows down. So when the market retracts and you expand your footprint when in a retracted market, your business explodes as the market re-expands, okay? You got to realize that right now, see, this opportunity will be gone in, say, three or four months because the market will be re-expanding by then. And you kind of miss the boat on expanding your footprint in your market. Right now is the moment you've got to go, you got to go even harder now then you would like January 1st, like happy new year. I'm excited. Like th- th- you should be going harder now than you are then. Right. Just based on the, the just sheer opportunity that's right in front of you. Yeah. And, uh, Sean, I a hundred percent agree, Ricky. Sean, you had a question. Go ahead. Hey, Ricky, appreciate you showing up. Uh, been a huge fan of yours for a while. Um, question. I'm getting more clients coming to me from my, my database now, just yesterday, where they're like, hey, I owe 150 on my house. I'm three months behind on my payment. I pull up comps to places worth 350, 400, but the rates on investment property are higher. Like, is there opportunity there if you were in our shoes? Like, as a well, buyer, do a buy down. Yeah, I can buy it down, but you're looking at investment property loans have four or five points on them right now. But my question would be is like, is that opportunity? Would you, if you were in a lender, would you be trying to grab some of those properties and bail out some of your clients? Like, buy them? Yeah, and then stick a renter in them for a year or two until the market appreciates. Yeah, okay. absolutely, I would if I could. That's what I'm doing. I'm buying properties left and right. It's just they're not cash flowing because if at, you're at seven, then you and don't half, buy it. Okay, so even just How like you maybe buy something that doesn't cash flow, future appreciation and tax deduction. No, no, no. You don't know what the market's going to do. Okay. That's it. Like you, uh, let me go on the hole every month to see if this thing goes up in value. Horrible business plan. Okay. If it doesn't cash flow, do not buy it. If you're not making money on it day one, don't buy unless you're going to build something. Unless you're building it, don't buy it if it doesn't cash flow. It's not a good deal. It's good advice. If you can buy it and it makes more money every month than it than it costs you, then you buy it. Would I help uh, maybe wholesale it? I mean. If the properties aren't moving, if there's 200 grand in equity in it. What's your other option to represent them on a, um, you're a mortgage guy? I'm a mortgage guy. I could refer them to one of my agents and try to help sell it. Uh-huh. But I don't know. It depends on the property. I don't know what the opportunity is, man. If you're telling me that it doesn't cash flow at the price that you're going to buy it at, then how the hell are you going to sell it, the wholesale it to somebody at a higher price, make a profit, and then them make sense out of it? Good point. Got a cash flow for them too. Okay. Right? Unless they're a yeah. and I don't want to take advantage of, of No, no, no. 
Well, what's interesting too is like on a primary purchase, you'll find that people just want the house. They're okay. They're not looking for them at, at the stand, like the, you know, if they're not, not an investor and they are the end user. That's different. Yeah. How many end use? I mean, you know, I mean, that'd be like a, a, a fucking shark biting you twice in the same day to find the perfect retail person to get you a profit, let you mortgage it. Like, you know what I mean? It could happen. But then where are we, what are we looking like well, on the seller who, who's sitting there pending with you, hoping you pull a rabbit out of your ass? <laughs> you know what I mean? I was I, just thinking, you know, if you can grab the property, you know, you're putting money in your, in, in my client's pocket. She's walking away with 150 grand. Yeah. But if the market is going to go up, like we all think it's going to. We think it is. Right. But we can't buy a, a property that, that doesn't cash flow, period. Okay. From an investment standpoint, yeah. That's what I read to hear. I, I'm not. Maybe you guys no have speculate. a point of view on this. Uh, you asked me the question, so I'm going to answer it. I'm not going to buy a property that doesn't cash flow. I don't care what I think it's going to do. I mean, it, it, if, if it's worth more money than what I'm buying it for. And I can flip that property and I know 100% it, and it doesn't cash flow, then I may flip it really quickly. But I'm not going to hang on to something that's, that I'm losing money on. Okay. So Ricky and, and uh, Sean, this is important too, is like a there's lot of too the many people... cash flowing. There's too many cash flowing opportunities out there to own something that loses money every month. The other thing I noticed too is people are doing, um, they're doing... Subject to a lot, you know, with pay, like what Pace Morby teaches and things like that. Finding these properties that you could buy under market value, but also taking over a lower rate loan so that you could cash flow. You got okay. Now that you're bringing that up, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Because, and I think Pace even said I've heard that Pace has even said that like he had the bank, you know, like call the loan on a couple of those. I don't like that. The, well, Pace has talked to our group and he. He's talked about, you know, this happens so rarely. The, the bank's goal is not necessarily to call a note due in full. They just want you to keep making your payments. That's their goal is not yeah. to talk to people and collect the payments. So we haven't, you know, in that community, there's a few of the members in the group who are more in depth into that community. And uh, I think it just depends on what your risk tolerance is. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you're, you know, if you, if you sleep like a baby at night under those circumstances, awesome, you know. So what are you looking at right now as far as like, you know, uh, two, two, two things we want to get into. And if anybody else has a question, uh, you know, go ahead and you can come off mute. We can, you can ask Ricky for sure. But I wanted to, I know one of the guys in the group is having a podcast with you tomorrow. Kenny, you're, you're, he's, he's doing a podcast with you tomorrow, which is awesome. But one of the things that's come up a lot, Ricky is like, you know, you, you're the media strategy, you know, as far as like, okay, you talked about this is actually a great question. Somebody wrote this earlier is like, if you were coming back into sales right now in the current market cycle, which, yeah. you know, there's a great opportunity. How would you structure your business? Is it that formula you just talked about as far as like making the calls, putting out the videos, this is your whole team structure in terms of like media and calls. I mean, I would like tactically, honest. Yeah, but, how would you do it? Like, like, okay, but kind of what I was trying to get at earlier on this is that when you when you let me go a little deeper here, when you crack that code, uh, when it comes to lead gen, and you realize, well, all this stuff doesn't matter. It comes back to conversations anyway. I could just talk to people, and I could literally have the same conversations I was having with leads I bought for a thousand bucks a piece or thirty five percent or whatever it is, and have the same conversations with even higher quality leads because I actually picked out the exact person I wanted to talk to. When you, when you get to that place where you can literally talk to anyone and make them feel like family, um, and you get so good at just creating demand out of thin air and like just, cre just creating just business out of nothing, um, because you understand what questions to ask, you understand what you're looking for, you understand like how to read between the lines when you're talking to your clients and everything like you can you can see you can vi as they're talking to me on the phone i i'm visualizing how the whole deal was playing out versus like a newer agent or inexperienced or doesn't understand what i'm saying they're they'll have the same conversation and walk away with something completely different that doesn't involve doing a deal versus i've already kind of mapped out exactly how to convert 
close and mo move on to referrals and stuff. Um, so for me personally, I could just walk in to the office and just get on the phone and make calls. All, that's all I would do all day long and just put deal after deal after deal together. Um, that's all I would do. Even if I was starting like fresh, brand new database, like cold, that's all I would do. Because for me, real estate's one of those businesses that it all comes back to that anyway. So if I'm going to make content, if I'm going to make media, that's kind of taken away from the conversations that I could be having to go do deals. This is this is Ricky like beast mode talking, right? What I tell the general public is, is make your calls all morning and do video all afternoon. Get really good at understanding the algorithm and, you know, getting better on camera or writing or, you know, whatever your thing is on social, get really good at it so that you can build that audience and build that. Following. What have you noticed for you putting out content every day? What videos are working the best for you? I see you do a lot of green screen Dude, videos. I, I just hit 100,000 on YouTube. And I've been doing it for seven years and it grew a lot in the beginning when I was documenting and doing a bunch of live calls. And then it kind of uh, leveled out for a while. It just slow growth. And then here lately and do in the last say 60 days, I think I finally figured out what I should be doing on YouTube after 2000 videos and seven years and a hundred thousand subs. I honestly feel like I just now understand a little bit about what I should be doing on YouTube. That's how long this this stuff takes. People do videos for like months and months or, you know, a year or whatever. And they're like, oh, nothing's happening or this, that or the other. It's like you hadn't even really got you had you barely got started trying to learn how to uh, grow on on social. Um Instagram is really like, I mean, there's days where I had a thousand new followers a day. Um, it with Instagram, um, I'm just mixing it up. So like I used to do just coaching like reels, right? Where it was just like great to like podcast clips and like coaching advice and they never really hit. I, I'd have something that hit every once in a while, but like I would, and I would do like four of those a day you know, for, 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 for like a year. And, you know, it'd be like a hundred likes, 200, 300, you know, every once in a while, like something like five or 600 or whatever. And, but I was doing that constantly thinking, okay, it would just keep doing it. It'll grow stuff like that. And, but like, as, as the things developed and I just got better and better and, and learned more things, what I learned is, is that mixing it up, is is really key like so now when you look at my instagram i've got the green screens that go like viral like there's there's some of those with several million views and like every one of those gets over a hundred thousand views and you know most of the time like two three hundred thousand views so it's your it's your reaction to the news yeah th th those really hit and so when i realized those really hit i'm like okay let me do this consistently until they don't really hit well they always hit why because it's like breaking news and that's what really hits on social is like breaking news and people want to know what your opinions are. Okay. So pay attention to what I'm saying here. This is, this is gold. Your opinions on what's breaking in whatever your niche is, is what's going to do the best on social. Okay. But that doesn't mean to only do that type of content either. If you'll notice, I still do the coaching reels that literally, like, I'll have a, a green screen reel that'll get, like, 4,000 likes and, like, you know, 3,000 comments or some shit. And right next to it will be a coaching reel that's, like, gold advice. Like, gold. And it's, like, 150, 250, 350 likes with, like, 19,000 views or something like that. But it's like, okay, well, Ricky, well, why do you do that? Well, it's because mixing it up in there doesn't hurt the green screen view. Like, because I put the coaching reel in there that I know when I post it is not going to do great. I know it. But it's such good information, and the people that do see it love it. But it doesn't, like, hit. It doesn't go crazy. That video being posted that has low engagement doesn't hurt my green screens that go viral, Right. And then if you look at the Twitter quote picks that I do, those hit. Those are always a thousand to three thousand likes every time. 
So, uh, and then I'm going back to my old reels and trying to pick out some, some of my favorites from like last year and the year before and stuff. Um, most of them suck. <laughs> most of them suck. Well, what I love is like, you just, you just try new things and then stick with it. And it's, and it's not production value. It's just you sharing your opinion. And so what's interesting, what's really important guys, what, what Ricky just said is like, not every video is meant, there's a different purpose for every video. Some videos are meant to to do better than others. There's actually, sometimes you could t think about it this way. Some of the videos that didn't perform in terms of reach performed in other ways that are even more valuable to your business. So think about like that tandem thing. It doesn't, the, having the, the low engagement one doesn't mess up your other one. So that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that's super important. Same um, thing on when, YouTube. Like I'm posting yeah. videos. When I do a coaching session, like I'll put this on YouTube. I'll put this session that we're doing right now on YouTube. It'll be nicely produced. It'll be beautiful. It'll be awesome. It'll be great content. It's gold. But guess what? It'll be get like 2,000 views when other videos are getting like 30,000 views. And I know it when I post it, it's not going to get that much. But the 2,000 people that did watch it got so much out of it. And it brought so much value. And then the ones that go viral, it brings in new audiences, right? That come in and then watch your lower engagement videos that bring a lot of value. And it's just, it's just kind of this. Yep. Yeah, I got a and I got a question on the YouTube thing, and then I wanted to ask you about something for the mortgage group as well. Is like on the YouTube strategy in terms of thumbnails, the technical side, like editing thumbnails. How what's your structure like? You shoot the videos once a week, and then no, you outsource no, no. that to yeah to a so team. Like the coaching videos, like this one, will probably hit in like two three weeks. So yep. the 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 little sessions I do like this where I'm just documenting a like a call um or like interviews that I'll do like I just interviewed Jeff Olson the uh, the author of the slide edge amazing interview um I'll get those I'll edit those out but the breaking news this and this kind of goes to what I'm saying with with Instagram the breaking news videos literally I film and edit those myself and post them that day. Cause it's break. Like it has to be posted immediately. Otherwise tomorrow it's old news. So the, ev so there's evergreen content that I try to create like a title and a thumbnail that will live forever where people in like three years are like, Oh, I want to like learn how to sell a hundred properties a year as, as a real estate agent. I'm going to click that's uh, people can click on that for like 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now versus you know the verdict is out on the trial people aren't going to watch that you know in a month you know it's going to be old news and so you've got this library of evergreen content that's needed that does not pop when you put it out there but it lives forever okay and then you've got the breaking news content on youtube that hits really hard the first week and then dies yep right so but but you need both you you've got to have both for your channel to, to 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 really you know grow and produce views and revenue and everything. You know it, it's it's kind of like the stair it's kind of like the the stair step uh, the wave uh, where every new high e every high is a new high and every low is is, is not as low as the last. It's not a new low. It's, it, it it's going in a direction that's upward because you're mixing in the the breaking news type videos with the evergreen videos you got to have both and and I, I and again just like instagram i was doing the coaching reels four times a day and i wasn't really growing on instagram i wasn't really getting much same thing on youtube i was just doing evergreen coaching content every day for years and it, it never really did pop off until i started to mix in these the breaking, breaking news type so I want to challenge everybody on the call today. Like that might be your biggest takeaway so far is like, look, after this call, I'm going to commit. I love making a commitment to other people because then you have to do it. Otherwise you're letting other people down. So I'm going to post a green screen just really quick. There's so much news out there right now that you can react to. And I'm going to do it. So if anybody else is with me on this, let me know in the chat. Would love to like get a few more of you guys doing this and posting it today because it doesn't have to go to an editor. Like, and if you need help on how to do it, we have a tutorial that can show you guys technically how to do it. Most of you already know how to do this because I've seen you do it. But if you don't know, we can show you. So I would challenge anybody. I got Danielle, we got Kenny, we got Liz, Sean, Kaplan, oh, Armando. Know, um, but while, while I'm thinking about it, you guys know how in the beginning of my, re a lot of most of my reels, I'm like, ooh, like that. Yeah. 
So like a lot of people are not a lot of people. Most people love it. They think it's hilarious. But uh, but some people kind of talk smack like, oh, that's annoying, this or that. And what they don't get is how intentional it is. It's not to try to be funny. It's not to, well, I mean, it is, it is to try to be funny, but it, it's not only to try to be a little entertaining. Understand this. Like this is how, this is the depths uh, that I go when it comes to being being tactical about creating, right? When somebody flips to one of my green screens, there's obviously going to be a, a title to a article, right? Okay. So think about this. If you flip to it and I'm just talking immediately, what do you have to do? Now you have to listen to what I'm saying and read the headline at the same time. And now you're just like, your brain is like exploding. You don't know how to like do both. So you don't know, you don't know what I'm talking about, what I'm giving context on, right? Immediately. And now, and by the time you do, I've already kind of went through the context. You see what I'm saying? So the ooh gives my gives my audience a chance to read the headline, okay, and like process what what I'm fixing to give context on before I start talking, even context on it. See what I'm saying? Yeah, this happened to me by accident, Ricky. So I had this thing that said two weeks ago, rates hit 8%. What was the opportunity? So I had the, in the background and I said, holy shit, guys. So it was, it was kind of a drawn out like thing like you're doing where I wasn't really talking. It was just pointing to the headline and then started giving my reaction to it. So I just, I didn't realize that that's uh, what I was doing, but it's by accident. And so that's a good, I think that's super important because, um, Trev talks about this a lot. We, we, we have a content group and we talk about like sometimes if it's confusing in terms of where your eyes are in terms of reading plus listening, if it's contradictory, it just, uh, people just scroll past you because they just can't, you know, can't process it. And also the placement of where the actual words of the, the headline is. It sure. cracks me up, dude, when people's heads are like in front of it and you can't even read it. Or if it's way up high where their name is and stuff and you can't, like you have to look through their name to get to it. It 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 cracks me up because it's like, do you even like pay attention to <laughs> like where the words need to be on the screen and stuff? Yeah. Um, well, it's yeah. just inexperienced. Oh, the, 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 the worst one, bro. The worst one is, is when you're flipping through and you see a real estate agent. And they're, they're immediately like, hi, my name is, you know, whoever at whatever real estate. Like, and they just like, they say their name and stuff first. Hi, who they, they are and stuff in the first like four seconds. Like people are scrolling right past that, dude. Like yeah. I can see your name. It's right there at the top. Tell me what you want to, like, you, you better hook me in right now. You only have like one second, literally less than a second to really get somebody's attention. Um your name, like you're, you're basically putting the hook in the beginning. Like that should be at the end, like who you are, what you're doing, how to get in touch, all that good stuff. So one thing I want to shift in real quick gears, I want to ask for the lenders here, like, you know, obviously all of us are getting value from, from the strategy on media and building business, but from a lender specific strategy, providing value to you as a real estate agent over the years, doing this much transactions, I'm sure you worked with lenders or you had I'm sure lenders hit you up all the time. What would you, what's your advice to that half the group right now who are, you know, top producing lenders, but want to take their business to the next level, want to help their teams grow? Like how should they be thinking about the business in terms of providing value to real, to realtors? Uh, I think it's a personality thing, honestly. Um, like who you, who you click with. Um, a lot of, um, uh, lenders and stuff have, have come at me, but the relationship I have with my guy is so strong that I'm not going anywhere. Um, so a, as a, a, in the mortgage business, you kind of have to think about a couple different strategies here, right? Um, new agents are, 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 is a really good market. That's one sector is new agents because they haven't, they may or may not have found their guy yet that they're going to, that's going to carry them through their career, right? Most agents lock into a lender or mortgage person you know, at some point in their career that just it, it does them right on the money, you know, doesn't let the clients down. It's always a smooth transaction. Everything always goes great. And that's who they lock into and they won't use anybody else for the most part. Right. 
Um, so new agents are great. Now new agents will quit the business. So you, you have to go through a lot of them to get to the ones that actually succeed. And then the ones that actually, you know, lock into you for their career. But man, that those, cause all you really need, I mean, how many agents do you think you guys need? Right. I mean, you, you need probably. You well, know. these days the number's gone up because the agents are working with multiple people sometimes, or they just don't have as many clients to refer to you, you know, so we were right. trying to like, that. you know, 10 to 20, you know, agents, you know, 10 to 20, 30, something like that, that you're really working hard. You have a great relationship with, they send you referrals, you know, you got a big business right there with just the referral side from agents. And then you've got your consumer business right over here. Um, as far as like the value to bring to agents, it's literally just doing what the fuck you said you're going to do. That's it. And like when a, when a, when a client, when you get a client, um, you know, if there's a problem, tell me, you know, tell me right now what my guy, he, I'll send him somebody and he'll run all their stuff and he'll call me and he'll be like, this is good. This is a slam dunk. And it always is when he says that it always closes. It's never not closed. Um, and then he, uh, and then if there's like a little, he's like, well, we have this one little hurdle, right? I have to get over this one little hurdle right here. It should be fine. I'll keep you informed about it. Right. In the beginning of my career, there were lenders that literally had hurdles. They didn't tell me about until the deal fell apart because of the hurdle. And it's like, man, if you would have told me about this earlier, I could have made some adjustments in the deal and we could have. You know, but now we're two weeks from closing and now you can't do it. And now we're screwed. You know what I mean? This is the, uh, this was the number one thing Tarrant told us too. We had a uh, Ryan Tarrant and a group and he was telling us the same thing as far as like, that's his first thing. First and foremost, responsiveness and communication. Mm -hmm. And then from there it goes from there. So we just noticed that like there, you know, a lot of agents are getting hit up from different, from all these different lenders and things like this. And we're, uh, we're just doing things to cut through that noise, you know, in terms of providing value. Because everybody uh, in this group is at that level in terms of communication and responsiveness, but it's just a matter of like, there's a lot of people saying that to the agent, you know, like I'm responsive, I'm good, I'm, you know, I do what I say I'm going to do. That's the. I mean, there, there's a the difference floor. in saying it and doing it, right? And that's what I say: do what you say you're going to do. I mean, if 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 you if you approach an agent, they have a lender, and you're like, listen, give me a shot. If something happens with the lender or whatever, I'd love to have an opportunity to show you what I got. And they give you that opportunity. You better go all out. I mean, because it's it's a little different than real estate agents. When I'm talking to a client as an agent, yes, that's that's multiple deals later, right? That they're gonna do, they're gonna sell that house later. They're gonna refer me people. That's like ten to twenty deals over the next, you know, fifteen years, sure. But with a with a mortgage person, this agent could be worth like ten deals a year. Right. I mean, this is a totally different ball game when you when you talk when you talk about referrals like this is a totally different ball game. You need to be going all out and not drop the ball on anything. Be total, totally transparent. Love that. And uh, real quick on the emails, because I know emails been a huge part of your growth in terms of uh, reaching out, you know, keeping communicating with people digitally. So oh, somebody shared in the chat, guys, one of Ricky's recent emails or it's team's emails. So you can check it out, but it's my emails. It's, I write them. I write them every week. I'm so what? Team. Awesome. Okay. So when you write this out, is this the same strategy? The one that shared is basically the stats on what's going on in the market, recent data, and let me know if you're, if you need help, if I can help in any way. Pretty much. Um, let me give you this. This is a better link to this. This is a year's worth of my emails. And I also have a four week email template system. So week one, stats of the month, week two, restaurant of the month, week three, deal of the month, week four, uh, news of the month. So just take the four week template, repeat it every month and just insert stuff about your local market, not national, not how to cook shrimp etouffee, not fucking how to, what color to paint your walls in the fall, 10 buyer tips to win more multiple offers, uh, garbage, you know, it, they want they don't they want local real like stats right and and information um and then they want your two cents on it all that's what that's what makes it that the the what i was saying with social how the breaking news type content is what 
is what works the best. And then you sprinkle in all the other value add type content that doesn't do as well. Same thing here. What really works is your opinions on what's happening locally. Here's the market stats. Here's the price per square foot compared to last year. Here's here's every listing in the market. Here's everything pending. Here's my two cents on it, right? I showed three buyers last week. Here's what they said. When you start giving people inside information based on your experience, because you're inside the business, they're like, they feel like they have this, like this inner channel into the market through you that they don't get anywhere else. Most people are just sending them surface level, um, generic bullshit, automated. They have companies doing it for them. And it's like the most horrible, horrible marketing you've ever seen. Um, okay. If, if this hurts anybody's feelings, I don't really care. If you're not doing your own emails, and giving your opinions on what's happening and you're letting another company do it for you, then you suck right now. I'm not saying you suck. I'm saying you suck right now, right? Get off your ass and start doing your own emails because this is your direct line of communication to your clients that they're going to pick you to be their agent because of. And you're going to you're gonna just throw that away and give it to somebody else's hands? Dude, they want to get to know you through your through your content if you're just sending generic content then they're not getting to know you they're just you're, you're they're they're getting to know another agent who's doing it and they're going to use that agent see i want you to be that agent or that mortgage person that they're actually picking over all the other generic robots right 100 percent, man like it's uh it's the going from generic to specific this is what we notice is working in content as well it's just being like specific like here's how i'm doing this here's how my i'm helping my clients do this rather than just the general stuff so yeah you can use a sean said he uses chat i don't know if you use chat gpt or ai tools to help you with your emails I don't. it's just the same formula okay so guys he ricky just so kind to share his uh templates and all that stuff there's a link in the chat make sure you grab that because it's uh, it's something that is repeatable. And what I love about what Ricky says, you know, some some people are probably like, man, I love Ricky's delivery. I love this. I know you guys are letting me know in the chat. Somebody else probably thinking, well, dude, this dude's a little harsh. What I'm telling you is Ricky always tells it like it is. You know, it's very, it's not complex. It's very simple. Like he's telling you the simple ways to do this. It's not complicated. He doesn't have a big team doing all these different things. It's like, hey, how, what's your systems and processes and team structure for this? Well, I sit down at the, computer at once a week and I type it out and you're like holy shit I didn't realize like it's it sometimes messes people up like I didn't think it was that simple well it, it is me, it that simple 15 minutes a week it goes out to 19,000 people 7,500 open it up every week and we sell two properties a week in this market as well too right it's been a little slower this year it's been a little slower um and I'm out of production, so my dad handles the day-to-day -day with listings and sales. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, just straight up, he's not the hustler that I was when I was just full-blown. Of course, you know, he's older and, and everything. I don't expect him to go out and, like, blaze. But um, that's another thing. I'm like, man, like, let me get back in the game for a second, man. I'm almost, like, you know, shaking over here. I'm ready to, I'm like, Jones going to get on the phone, but... If I do, I'm like Mike Tyson. Once I start working out, I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. So, I don't know if I want to cross that line or not because that's like unleashing the beast. Well, dude, I love the uh, intensity and and uh, being just sharing your sh the truth. You know, that's the part I think that really cuts through the noise, and not really worrying about you know, like a lot of people talk shit about your stick on how you're getting you know where you start your video with the same thing. But you can't argue with the result. You know what I mean? Like people are watching the video I mean, as an option. Awesome. The bigger you get, the more haters you're going to have. Um, you know, I've got plenty, not as many as some. Proportionally the same as probably anybody else. Um, yeah, it's fun. I don't really care about all that. Um, like it, the, here's the thing, guys. And when you, 
Some people are like, well, the weekly email, people are going to unsubscribe. Okay, well, the people that unsubscribe, are they going to do business with you anyway? And if you don't do the email because of the people that you think might unsubscribe, what you're doing is, is you're pandering to the people who don't want to do business with you, but you're not giving that content to the people who love you. You're restricting the people that love you and you're catering to the people who don't want to do business with you, right? Same thing with the content. I mean, a small, small sliver, bro, of people don't like what I'm doing. That's with anything you do. Um, but the majority of people love it. Um, so I've got to keep doing it because I don't, I'm not going to cater to the people who, you know, talk shit, you know? And, and honestly, too, guys, with social media, some people see, like, celebrities' posts and all the hate that comes out of those 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 comments and it scares the shit out of a lot of people they're like i don't want to even get into that ball game and deal with all that hatred and everything like that but when you when you get out there and you do pick up a few haters and everything i mean you got to understand like the mindset of a hater that's a whole different conversation but the people who aren't even commenting that are quietly watching your stuff that love it you know, there's so many more of those people. They're not even commenting. They just see it. And they just love it. They just watch it. They may like it. They just keep scrolling. They don't really say anything. They're just kind of quietly over there. And you're just building this army of people that just love your stuff. Don't cater to the people who might talk because then you're just going to you're in a losing battle because you're never going to win the war against people that talk shit ever. Yeah. And I'll say this just to wrap up, guys. Uh, the yesterday I shared a post, a personal success story post, and shared it on Instagram. And you know it's cool to see, like Ricky said, there's a ton of people who engaged, who, you know, who watch it and are high fiving me, but they don't say nothing. But then there's a hundred people in the comments saying something nice, like dude, like giving me a pat on the back or high fiving me, and that's cool. It's awesome, really cool. There's one person, there's one person in the comments that said, you know what, bro. This is like you showing off a little bit too much. I'm unfollowing you. Just one person. But it's crazy. Like there's literally a hundred others that said, this is awesome. So like, what am I going to do? Cater to that one dude who is already unfollowing me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So just think about that in terms of like, even at scale, and I don't have the same scale as a lot of, you know, huge content creators, but even at a relative amount of scale I have, it's usually one person in, you know, thousands that's going to say something like that. So I would just encourage you guys to not even worry about it. So anyways, guys, thanks, Ricky. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, really appreciate the time and the resource that you shared with us. Anyway, do you have anything else you wanted people to connect with you or anything else that you're working on right now you want to let people know about? Nothing too much. I got the uh, 30 listing challenge happening right now. I'm, I'm redoing the uh, Zero to Diamond site. That's the free coaching program. I'm redoing it where you don't have to log in. It's just going to be a course there. You can just go to it. I'm going to release that in December. I'll do a huge 2024 business planning session that I always do. There's always thousands of people there. Uh, connect with me on Instagram and YouTube and just reach out. DM me on Instagram. Go to the link in my bio for the 30 listing challenge and just let me know what I could do to help you. So I answer all those messages myself and I'm happy to help, guys, whatever I can do. Thank you, bro. Really appreciate your time. Thanks all everyone for being here today and uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. I-35 with the top down, quit the